All right. Can you see my screen? Yeah, we're looking good. Perfect. So I'm going into present mode. Uh, and let me know. And, and feel free to stop me or like if you have any questions um, in the middle, or we can also take them in the end. So let's kick it off. Um, so today I'm going to be doing a, a presentation on um, Intro to Ceph, which is an open source distributed storage system. Um, it's not just a file system, it's a distributed storage system. And I'm going to talk about what exactly it is in, in for the slides. And as far as uh, my introduction goes, as I said earlier, I am a project technical lead for Rados, which is a component of uh, Ceph. So uh, today, what I plan to cover uh, in this intro to Ceph talk is um, what is Ceph and uh, why should we care about it, first of all. Um, I will then transition into a little bit of the Ceph architecture. And as you can see, the first uh, component there is Rados. That is the component that I lead. And then I'm also going to be touching on RGW, which um, is our object um, storage. It stands for a Rados gateway. RBD, which is the Rados block device, uh, CephFS, which is actually this uh, Ceph file system. Um, and then finally, we'll also touch upon uh, some of the management plane of Ceph uh, and uh, what options uh, do users have, uh, and also delve into the community and ecosystem that we have around Ceph. So this is kind of what I plan to cover. Let's directly move into what is Ceph. So in general, Ceph is often defined as software-defined storage. It's also called um, unified storage, scalable distributed storage. Uh, in a lot of our Ceph t-shirts, you'll see um, it's called the future of storage. And a lot of our users also like to call it the Linux of storage. So these are kind of buzzwords uh, you'll hear around storage. But essentially, what Ceph is, is it's just an open source software. Um, and when I say it's open source, it means that you can run it on any kind of commodity hardware. So note that it's it's just the software. So the hardware can be anything that you really want. So it can run on commodity hardwares. All it needs is IP networks to hook onto. And then uh, the underlying devices can be of any kind, um, which is hard disk SSDs and VMEs, anything that you can think of. Um, the interesting thing about Ceph is that in a single cluster, it can serve object block and file workloads. So what I described early in my earlier slide, uh, RGW, RBD, and CephFS are the kind of workloads that you can actually essentially run in a single Ceph cluster. Um, and that's, that's something that is unique about Ceph, I would say. So let's move on. Um, so Ceph is essentially free and open source. Um, so when I say free, what does that mean? Um, Anybody is free to use Ceph. As I said, it's open source. It's all, all our source code is uh, on GitHub. So anybody can just start using Ceph. Um, we have all our packages that we build that you can uh, download and start running Ceph on, on your hardware even today. Um, when we say that we give you the freedom to introspect, modify, and share, it also means that we want you to be part of, uh, of the decision making or even contribute code um, to make the, the project better, the product better. So um, we welcome uh, code from the community and uh, we, we have contributors from you know, different fields, from academic fields, from industrial fields and anything that you can actually think of. So that's where uh, the, the freedom to uh, modify and share also comes in. There is no free. Uh, there is no uh, vendor lock-in. As I said, uh, Ceph is just the software. You can literally decide what kind of hardware you want to run it on. So your software stack remains the same. And if you you, you you prefer to run it on a different kind of hardware for whatever reason, you can essentially choose to do that. Um, and finally, the freedom to innovate. Uh, given that all our code is all open source, and we have all our um, so we, when we say open source, there is a word called upstream. So everything is upstream. So all our uh, design discussions, all our code reviews happen um, in the open. So anybody is welcome to come and contribute code and uh, add you know, innovative ideas into the um, Ceph code base. Moving on, um, Ceph is reliable. Um, 
I do hear some chat, but I can't see it because I'm just sharing my screen. So let's hold off on any of those questions if they are for me uh, up, up to the end. Um, and if you want to ask questions, feel free to stop or like you know say something. That'll that'll give me an idea that somebody has a question. Um, so I'll I'll keep going. Um, so. Ceph uh, is reliable. So essentially, the idea is to build reliable storage servers out of unreliable components. So essentially, the software that we provide can be run on, on commodity hardware, which can be unreliable. But the software essentially makes sure that uh, the, the, the storage capabilities and the redundancy and replication, et cetera, is taken care of by Ceph. Um, so it also has no single point of failure. When I say replication, we have like other ways of, of replicating data. We have just pure replication. We have erasure coding that we support. So data durability is taken care of by these mechanisms. Um, and we also don't have any kind of interruption of service. Essentially, we do we support rolling upgrades. Um, all our expansion is online, so your system can uh, continue to um, uh, serve the application that is running on it while you're expanding your system and all that kind of stuff is uh, supported. And finally, we favor consistency and correctness uh, over performance. So anytime we are put in a hard spot where we have to choose, we do choose consistency and correctness over performance. Uh, we do give a lot of emphasis on performance, but uh, yeah, as, as as it said, so if uh, some of you are aware uh, of the uh, CAP theorem, so in, in CAP you have like CP or AP, so uh, like essentially CEPH is CP, so it's uh, consistency uh, over availability when it comes to partitions. Um, Ceph is scalable, so it's essentially elastic storage infrastructure, so you can just grow and shrink your um, uh, storage cluster based on uh, on your needs. And uh, you can add and remove hardware while the system is online and under load, just, just what I described earlier. Um, based on your needs and your application's needs, you can scale up with bigger and faster hardware, um, or you can also scale out within a single cluster for like, capacity and performance. So it's entirely up to you what you want to optimize for. Uh, we also have... Um, something called federation, the concept of federation, where we federate multiple clusters across sites with asynchronous replication and disaster recovery capabilities. So this is essentially uh, an, a radars gateway uh, feature. I will be talking more about this uh, if you're curious. So all right, coming to this, uh, this diagram, and I think this is the diagram which is most commonly found when you actually go to Google for Ceph. Uh, this is one of the things that comes up first. Um, this is a very simple picture that actually uh, describes the architecture of Ceph. So on top, you, you can see there's object block file. So object is essentially Rados Gateway, which serves uh, S3 and Swift object storage. Block is RBD which is essentially a virtual block device. And uh, as far as CFFS is concerned, it's essentially a distributed network file system. And what lies in between is the Liberators uh, API layer. And what um, I actually take care of and, uh, and which serves all kinds of these applications is Rados which you, you can see is sitting on the bottom. So Rados is this layer which essentially um, interacts with the hardware. Uh, and all these kind of applications that are running on top are actually talking to Rados to, to serve any kind of IO. So Rados is this um, reliable, elastic, distributed storage layer uh, which provides replication and erasure coding. So let's talk more about Rados now. Uh, I would like to uh, like stop and ask, is, are there any questions or sh should I keep going? There are some comments on the, uh, on the chat. Uh, okay, let me, I'll have to probably get out of screen sharing. Oh, I can read them. It's just commentary. Yeah. 
Okay, turns out the stopping share screen uh, screen share is actually yep. in my browser. So sorry okay. about that. Uh, but let's go to the questions. Uh, I was going to ask, what does CEF stand for? CEF doesn't, it's not really an acronym. Um, it's just um, a term uh, which was chosen because of, uh, I mean, if you notice, like CEF has this association with octopus. So, I mean, that is where even our t-shirts and everything have octopus. And even our releases are um, named based on. So, yeah, I think the CEF Lepod is where the CEF word comes from. Uh, but all our releases are uh, in alphabetical order, and we try to choose words which are related to uh, CEF Lepods or like octopus or like you know, sea creatures in general. So that's kind of where uh, CEF com comes from. But I guess that's the only question. Are there any more questions? Sounds good. Thank you. Well, um, yeah, no problem. But just in favor of not crashing my browser again, just let me just quickly try to share my screen. All right, can you see my screen? Looks looks good. All right. So we were, yeah. So CEF is actually not an acronym, but RADOS is. Um, so it stands for Reliable Autonomic Distributed Object Storage. So this is the common layer that sits underneath um, and is responsible for um, underpinning object, block, and file services. Now, it provides this reliable, highly available, um, and scalable storage system that you can actually run any kind of application of your choice on top of. Um, it takes care of uh, all, all the replication and the erasure coding, um, data placement, um, scrubbing, um, data integrity, rebalancing, repair, et cetera. So essentially, the application doesn't need to take care of anything. So as long as um, you're using the API to talk to Radus, Radus will take care of all these kind of things. And as I mentioned earlier, uh, we provide strong consistency. So we um, favor CP over AP in the CAP theorem. Um, and this whole, um, so this common layer sitting underneath in the architecture, it kind of simplifies the design and implementation of the higher levels. All they need to do is to be able to um, use the API, the Liberados API, uh, to be able to communicate with the um, uh, with the Rados layer. All right, so let's uh, now talk about some of the, uh, so as I said, Ceph is software, Rados is also software, so there are some components that come with it. Um, so in Rados, there are particularly these three uh, components, and uh, I think uh, it's important that we look at these pictures because these pictures uh, or these symbols are gonna show up in future slides as well. So essentially, um, you have something called um, Ceph Mon, which is the monitor. Uh, this is essentially the central authority for authentication, data placement, policy, et cetera. Uh, coordination is, uh, is one of the major things that monitors do. Um, and it also takes care of critical cluster state. And we have an implementation of Paxos, um, which we, uh, we use for such um, coordination. Uh, in usual scenarios, you have three to seven per cluster. Um, I must say that it's three to seven and not three, four, because we we, we need odd number of uh, monitors to uh, break uh, ties. So moving on, uh, the next component is called a manager. So unlike the monitor, you don't have three or seven of them. You generally have one active manager and one or two standby. The idea is that it, they don't really have any state. Um, but uh, in case there is something wrong with the active manager, it just, um, the, the standby just beca becomes the active. So you fail over. Uh, what these managers do is essentially they aggregate real-time metrics um, like throughput, disk usage, et cetera, from different demons in the cluster. And they kind of aggregate it uh, for higher level services. 
uh, when I say high level services, the, the, man, the manager also has these pluggable uh, management functions called modules. So there are implementations written in Python um, in the manager, which can use all the metrics that are collected uh, from the cluster and do things like, you know, we have one of the most uh, common ones is the dashboard. So dashboard is uses all these kind of metrics and all the cluster state and displays it to, to the end user. Um, there are also uh, optimizations that we run uh, in, uh, in terms of manager modules um, on the cluster. So the manager is essentially responsible for uh, these kind of pluggable, uh, pluggable management functions. Uh, and finally, object storage daemon, uh, which is the OSD, which is the, the daemon that is responsible for actually um, writing uh, data or storing data on uh, hard disks or SSDs or any kind of hardware. Um, they essentially uh, serve client IO and are not just like um, uh, you know dumb demons. I would say they they are active in um, co cooperatively peering. They talk to each other. They exchange heartbeat messages. Uh, they take care of replication traffic, rebalancing, um, and uh, you can have tens to thousands of um, OSDs in your cluster based on what scale. Um, your cluster is and what kind of application you're trying to run. I think the, the largest we've heard is we've had like more, 10, more than 10,000 OSDs in a cluster um, that was running Ceph. So moving on, um, now let's go into uh, the architecture of Ceph. And uh, I would like to start by, um, by talking about the legacy client server architecture, um, which is not what Ceph uses. But the problems that that we, we saw in it and we decided not to use it is like, you know, essentially when you have an application and a server, um, when you have just one server, this kind of model works fine. But you, when you have multiple servers and when you have a distributed system, this kind of architecture does not scale. So um, there have been tricks like virtual IPs, failover pairs, gateway nodes, et cetera, that have been used. Uh, but what we have in Ceph is something uh, even better. So what we like to call our architecture is um, client cluster architecture. So the idea is that you have an application and you have some smart uh, sort of smartness um, in the application that does smart request routing, um, flexible network ad addressing, and even um, sample uh, simple uh, application API. Like the application API is simple, so the application knows which exact uh, storage daemon to go talk to uh, based on of some information that is stored um, in, in the net, network addressing um, table uh, that we have. So as you can see in, in the bottom, uh, you, you can recall some of those um, symbols that we saw, the managers, monitors, and OSD. So that is essentially what defines a RADOS cluster. So how is data placement actually done? Um, that's a big question um, because um, we have an application and you have a data object. So in, in Rados or like even in Ceph, uh, the gran granularity of, of um, data being written is in terms of object. So when you have a data object, uh, how do you know where to write that object? So one option could be that you could have like a metadata server uh, which has all uh, the information of where this data object is stored. So an, ap an application would first talk to the metadata server, find out where to look up this object, and then go directly talk to the uh, object. Now, the problem here is that lookup step is slow, and it is hard to scale when, it, when you reach trillions of objects. So what we have instead is what we call calculated placement. So the idea here is that, so if you see uh, on the top here, the, the monitors essentially hand out key piece of information to the application that lets them figure out where exactly the data object lives. So in this case, it, you can see that the, op, the monitor hands out like a, a cluster map or a layout of the number of OSDs that are there or what the what the uh, cluster looks like essentially. And the application can use some intelligence to figure out uh, where exactly that data lives and go directly talk to the uh, data um, instead of going to a metadata server. 
So this um, calculate, we'll talk about how this calculation is done in the next slides, but the idea is to use some sort of smartness here and directly talk to uh, the, the storage demons uh, and eliminate the, the middleman or the metadata server from, from the picture. Uh, now the next question is what happens when when the map that I, I said earlier is shared with the application and the and the topology of the cluster changes. In that case, there are there's periodic exchange of um, these maps that happen from the meta, uh, from the monitors to the application. So uh, once there is a node failure or the topology has changed uh, because you've added nodes or removed nodes, etc. Uh, these new maps get propagated to the application, and then this calculation step happens again, and we deterministically figure out where to read and write um, from, which OSD to read and write your data from. Now, moving on, I talked about what um, objects are, but now let's see what they actually have. So every Rados data object has a name. The, this name could be tens of characters. As you can see, there's an example here. Um, we also have um, attributes. Now, these attributes um, may or may not be used based on the application that you're running. Uh, but you could have something like a version. You can think of something like a version, which is an attribute that you can store in an object. Now, uh, when it comes to data, there are two kinds of data. So there is byte data which could be from zero to hundreds of megabytes. And then there is something called OMAP, which is key value data. So these key value data, as you can imagine, like the key value pairs that you can store in each radius object. Um, and you can do that for like tens or uh, ten thousands of items. And a lot of scenarios, uh, you'd either have byte data or you'd have OMAP data. In very rare scenarios, would you have both? But each radius object is capable of storing all, all of this. So um, the picture on the right tells you like all these objects are living in something called pools. So we have this construct of pools. So um, all these objects, any, any radius object is part of a, a radius pool. So that is why we say it lives in, in named pools. Now let's, uh, the next slide will actually tell us how this uh, placement is happening or like an end to end picture of where, where, where the application um, has a file that it needs to store in, in Rados and the OSDs and how, what are the steps involved in doing that. So you can imagine that uh, on, the, on the left, you can see all kinds of applications like you have a video file, you have a picture, you could have like a, a just a regular file. Um, in this example, we are choosing this um, foo.mpeg file. So what, what objects mean is that this huge file is uh, divided into multiple objects. And these, is uh, the naming here suggests, are sequential. So you're just breaking one big file down into multiple objects. And we, uh, Rados has a size limitation, or like we have a default object size. That we use, so you can imagine something like you know uh, four megs that you're breaking this big file into. Now, as I mentioned earlier, like all all these uh, objects uh, belong to a pool, so you can imagine like a pool uh, has bazillions of objects uh, where it's actually storing a, petab a petabytes uh, of of data. Now, um, in order to um, easily reference what objects are, we have another construct, which is called placement groups. So each pool essentially gets divided into multiple pieces. Um, and in this case, you can see we have 4096 four, uh, placement groups. Uh, but the idea is to break each pool down so that all these objects that are present here will be part of one of those um, placement groups. So uh, the way we do this, um, you know, the, the, the divide is using this uh, function here. So we do a hash of the object name. Like I mentioned earlier, each object has an object name. Uh, we do the hash, and then we do an, a modular to decide which exact placement group an object is going to be part of. So essentially, you're distributing all these bulk of objects into different placement groups. Now. Um, these placement groups, in turn, have uh, 
uh, have OSDs that they get mapped into. So each um, based on what kind of replication strategy uh, you want to use, like in this example, uh, you can imagine that this 1.0 has a replication strategy that we want three copies of this data. So there'll be a bunch of OSDs and there'll be three OSDs that will be picked uh, to store this 1.0 data which is there in this placement group. And similarly, you can you can uh, extrapolate the logic to the rest of the uh, PGs that are there in this cluster. So the idea is this big, big file here gets broken down into objects. Objects are part of a pool. Now pools are divided into placement groups, which in turn live in different OSDs. And, and there are n copies of each PG based on like what n you choose. All right, now um, some may ask why why do we even have this construct of placement group and why not just replicate like like you have disk A, just replicate disk A uh, in three different disks. Um, the, it's all uh, almost the concept of mirroring, right? So um, the problem here is that um, each device that you have here should be of the same size. Otherwise, you are going to be able to write only um, data worth of the smallest device possible, which are, is there in your group. So that way, you are basically wasting um, uh, storage. Um, the other um, thing is that when when you need, let us say, there is a failure, and you need to um, replicate to a new, new disk, what you need is you need an extra spare disk that you will copy your data into, and then you will actually be um, bound to the throughput at that spare disk that you use for recovery purposes. Now, if you use the concept of PGs that we talked about earlier, replication in PGs is not done per disk. So essentially what can happen is like here you have these colors. So this cream colored, um, uh, P, you can imagine this is a one PG is living in three separate uh, random uh, disks. So if let us say there is a failure of one node, the, like this particular uh, node here has PGs of cream color and PGs of blue color. So if there is a failure of one node, uh, you'd have to find a new place for the cream colored uh, PG to go to and another for this blue colored to PG to go to. But this time, you can choose randomly new uh, any other disks. You don't have to replicate the entire um, disk in this case. So it's easier. And it's um, and since the placement is random, you can uh, the probability of, uh, again, picking the same uh, new uh, host for that PG is very low. So you'll probably be picking two separate hosts. So the recovery uh, throughput is also not going to be bounded. So essentially, you can do two recoveries versus one recovery at a time in the first case. And finally, we can go the extreme route uh, and say that we don't even need the concept of PGs, and we can replicate objects. Like we, we can choose any um, object uh, to place in any disk that is there in the cluster. Ideally, uh, one can do that. Uh, but uh, the accounting and um, even the probability of failure or like even uh, grouping fa uh, failure domains becomes a real challenge in, kind, in this scenario. So what we've decided to do, uh, this, this is another explanation of why, um, why, we, we, why uh, replicating um, by, by disk is a, is not a great idea because you need an empty spare to recover that disk and you again bottle what I already touched upon. And in this, you don't have, in this case, you don't need a spare disk. In both these cases, you don't need uh, spare disks, but the final case here, what would happen is that um, if there is a disk failure, given that any object can literally reside in any um, disk, you'd have uh, a lot more recovery uh, participants in terms of OSTs uh, that are there. So what we have decided to go with, uh, in Ceph with is this replicate through PG concept. Um, now the next part is about um, the, what is the, wh what are the downsides? I would say so. Like replicate if you replicate by disk. Uh, in cases of triple failures, uh, there is very little chance of uh, data loss. Uh, but in 
in terms of when you have replication by object, there are very high chances that um, three of your uh, different uh, objects that are part of different PGs are in the same um, in the same host. So you could essentially lose all the copies. But in case when we have replication by PG, uh, the probability, like I described earlier, that you know when you lose one host here, uh, the probability of losing all three copies is very low. So in this case, when you lose, let, let us say, this disk, when you had the replication by object, all the three copies of your object can potentially be in one disk. So it's possible to have complete data loss. So uh, I guess this. Uh, Replication by PGs is a uh, mix of both worlds and not, not too extreme in both cases. Uh, it kind of works for uh, most scenarios. So um, about keeping data safe, um, I guess in um, academic literature, this is called uh, declustered replica placement. So the more number of clusters you have, the faster your recovery is going to be, and uh, more even the data distribution is going to be. Um, and in fewer clusters, uh, there's lower risk of concurrent failures affecting all replicas, like, like we saw earlier in the, in the, in the first case. Um, but I guess placement groups is kind of the middle path here. So you don't need any spare devices. You can um, adjust the balance between durability um, in terms of concurrent failures. And you also are not spending too much time and uh, making your recovery process efficient. Um, so uh, in terms of avoiding concurrent failures, there are concepts in Ceph that allow you to do that. So you can do things like um, place your data smartly so that even if you have a failure, uh, the probability of losing um, or complete data loss is very low. And the probability of, of that loss affecting the cluster's availability is also very low. So like we have these separate replicas across failure domains. So what you can do, uh, things like you can say that if you have three replicas, you can say that I want all my three replicas in different racks. So in case when there is a host that fails uh, in a particular rack, um, then you're guaranteed that only one copy of your data will be affected uh, and not more than that. And there are other, other um, uh, rules like that you can come up with based on your requirements. Uh, there's also a, a hierarchy of storage that can be created just by using the same uh, um, uh, techniques and exp expressing placement uh, policy uh, in terms of hierarchy uh, of this logical hierarchy. You can do that, that and ensure that your uh, physical locality kind of maps to this placement logical um, policy that you create based on where your data center is or where you're actually your disks and um, racks reside. So there is, um, I will talk about crush in Ceph, which essentially helps you do that. But uh, there are multiple ways in which you can make sure that your data is safe in the Ceph cluster. Um, please, again, yeah, so this is what I wanted to get to. So placing PGs with crush. Um, so crush is an algorithm and there is a paper. Uh, so there are, there's a paper on Rados, there's a paper on Ceph, and there's a paper on crush. And anybody who's interested, I would really recommend that they read this paper. But the general idea is the placement that we were talking about earlier uh, is done by crush. So crush is nothing but a pseudo random uh, placement algorithm. It's repeatable, deterministic, um, and it calculates the same thing every time. It's very similar to consistent hashing. So in this picture on the right that we saw earlier, this algorithm takes um, inputs like cluster topology, um, what kind of OSD hierarchy you have, what is the replication factor, what is the PG ID, and what it would spit out is like a list, an ordered list of OSDs that you should be placing your data in according to crush. So essentially, like when you you give in um, in the right in the picture on the right, it came up with this first one, third one, and the fourth one um, based on whatever parameters we provided. So that's the general uh, concept that um, crush uses, and um, it also um, and this it is uh, so I've been describing a very simple. Um, replication um, 
a policy, but it also supports erasure coding. So like you can do things where you can set up an erasure coded uh, pool um, and make sure that your failure domain is such that you can um, you can lose n number of copies without losing data. So yeah, I think before we move to the next one, I think there are a couple of other things I would like to touch upon. Um, so one limitation that we saw earlier about when we when we talked about disk replication, replication at the disk level, was that you needed to have all the devices of the same size. Uh, but with um, when we have placement groups and when we have crush, you can do things like, uh, let us say you have a mix of SSDs and hard disks and some of your SSDs are smaller and hard disks are larger. So you can um, vary the device sizes and tell crush that you want to place lesser data or fewer PGs on your SSDs versus what you want to place on hard disk. So it's not like an umbrella number or like number of PGs that we get bottlenecked by. So we can assign weights um, to OSDs based on the device type that they are on, they are, they are hosted on. All right. so. Let's now talk about, uh, so before I move to replication, I didn't hear any questions. Were, are there any questions so far? I'm not hearing anything, so I will keep going. All right, so the next part here is about replication and erasure coding, and how do we actually do that in Rados? Um, so each Rados pool has a property which decides whether the pool is going to use replication or erasure coding. Um, and this is just for durability purposes. Um, so in replication, uh, what we have is identical copies of each PG. So essentially in this picture, uh, you have uh, two objects, data and my object. And uh, the same um, objects are replicated three ways. So there are three separate OSDs that have the same copy of your data. Um, versus an erasure coding, if you see, uh, the concept of erasure coding um, allows you to shard the data into multiple pieces, and then you have these coding chunks. So you're, you, you essentially have, like, you can see this is a four plus two erasure coding scheme. So you have shard zero to shard five, where uh, zero to three is essentially storing the data bits, and you have um, uh, you have the re rest of the two other parity bits. Um, the difference uh, in uh, erasure coding and uh, replication, one uh, major thing would be uh, the overhead. In uh, re replication, the overhead is three x, which is essentially two hundred percent, because you're essentially storing the same data in three places. Uh, but with erasure coding, uh, the, the overhead is clearly lower because you only have actual data in four places and you have just two coding chunks. So if you lose a couple of copies um, out of this, you should be able to, uh, I, I should say not copies, I should say shards. If you lose a couple of shards, you should be able to um, recover your data just fine. So the storage overhead is lower in erasure coding, but um, when it comes to recovery time, or um, rebuild time, uh, replication is much faster because essentially what you're doing uh, when you lose one copy of, of your replicated pool, you are just copying from one of the available copies. But erasure coding doesn't work like that. You need to be re reading multiple copies to rebuild the data and generate the new, new shard again. So there is extra uh, complexity and recovery time that comes with erasure coding. Uh, but if you just want to optimize for space, um, erasure coding is something that you can use. So I guess if, and Ceph supports both. Uh, we do have recommendations as to when you should be using replication and when you should be use, using erasure coding. But in terms of supporting, we support both. All right, um, moving on. So specialized pools. Um, so in Ceph, you can do things like um, you can just use a mix of pools in the, in the same Rados cluster. So you can imagine you have a 3x replication SSD pool. You have another pool, which is um, 
an EC pool and an erasure coded pool, which is on hard disks. And you have another one, which is just hard disk, but using your application. Um, it's, a to it's totally a user choice, I would say, as to what you want to use. Um, uh, po pools essentially also share devices. This is until and unless you tell Crush not to. So if you just create a, a Rails cluster and create three different pools, you would be sharing um, all the devices. But there are ways in which if you do not want to share uh, pools and you want, let us say, you want your SSD pool to be restricted to only a few set of OSDs, you should be able to do that as well. Um, it is elastic in the sense that you can deploy new hardware and the existing Rados cluster can uh, consume the new devices that you've added. Existing pools can also use that. The only um, challenge is that with erasure coding, uh, the decision of, um, of how large your pool is or what your K and M parameters are need to be taken at pool creation time. But for replication, it's as simple as you can increase your replication factor uh, by just changing a configurable in the pool. And uh, so you can go from 3x replication to 5x replication uh, based on, the, on your need. But in erasure coding, you cannot do that. So that's one difference. But um, in general, adding and uh, removing devices, et cetera, uh, should work the same. So, uh, so in a way, Rados is actually virtualizing uh, storage. So you have multiple applications that are running on top. They may have dif different uh, storage requirements. They may have different performance requirements, uh, but they can actually essentially um, share the same Rados cluster uh, by means of creating these separate pools that are going to consume the same um, uh, same devices underneath, which are controlled by by Rados. All right, so I think th this going back to the same picture. So now we have a good understanding of what this Rados layer provides. Um, and now I think we will go a little bit into the higher level stuff or the platforms that are supported uh, by, by Rados. Uh, but before that, I did hear some things. Uh, are there any questions in the chat? Okay, if not, I'm just going to keep going with uh, RGW. So RGW, as I mentioned earlier, it stands for Rados Gateway. Uh, it provides object storage for Ceph. It is essentially um, S3 and Swift compatible object storage, downloaded over HTTPS, and it's a REST-based uh, API. Um, people often uh, combine with the load balancer, but you can Imagine RGW providing um, storage for the public internet or even private clouds. So, uh, in S3, uh, what you or like in RGW, what you have is this concept of users, uh, buckets, and objects. Now, uh, these are S3 construct constructs as well, um, but these objects are different from Rados objects that we talked about earlier. So, these essentially have um, data uh, and permission models. Uh, which are based on S3 and Swift APIs. Um, and they also have ACL-based permissions imposed by RGW. So these permissions can actually be set in the RGW layer, and there's nothing much happening at the Rados layer. So essentially, these RGW objects, which are much larger, I would say, compared to Rados objects, which have a definitive size. Um, so these large RGW objects are broken down into Rados objects um, which are then striped across um, the Rados cluster. So that's essentially what the picture on the right um, tries to say, that you have the RGW, which is talking uh, this S3 compatible language, and then you have the Rados cluster, which is essentially storing all the RGW uh, objects uh, by striping it across the Rados cluster. All right. so. RGW stores its data in Rados, and how does it do that? So uh, this picture kind of um, tries to explain what the workflow is. So when um, you do an S3 uh, level uh, put, what happens is, and you can imagine um, 
RGW, like Amazon's S3 servers, um, an equivalent of that. So es essentially any um, S3 uh, put or post that happens comes to the RGW layer. Um, by means of this uh, Rados API there, we have first this concept of bucket, a user plus bucket info pool. So this pool is a Rados pool, but this pool is the first thing that have that um, gets used when an S3 request comes. So the idea is to check uh, whether a user with that name exists, whether a bucket exists or not. So essentially uh, checking for the validity of the request that has come in. So at this point, we are just contacting this um, uh, info pool. This is just the information pool. So once we get an acknowledgement from this pool that everything looks good, uh, RGW then talks to this next pool, which is the bucket index pool. So this bucket index pool is required because um, we need we have um, this index, which is essentially a sorted lexicographic, um, and it is required for sorted lexicographic enumeration of um, uh, buckets. And that's something that uh, S3 also uses. So essentially, any request that comes in uh, makes an update to this index pool before it actually goes and writes to the data objects. So step two is done here. And after we have updated the index pool, we go ahead and RGW essentially talks to this data pool, um, which finally does uh, the IO uh, to disk. And then after the IO completes, there is a step of updating the index object, letting the index object know that this IO has completed. And that's where uh, kind of, um, the, the the request finishes and the client gets an acknowledgement. So as as this I mean, mapping back to Rados, I think the three uh, common things here are three different pools in RGW being used for different purposes um, uh, to uh, to fulfill an S3 uh, kind of request. So moving on, um, so RGW also has. Um, RGW um, zones. So what a zone has is it could have multiple RGWs, as you can see in the picture, and it could have multiple uh, data pools. It could be a mix of replication and erasure coding as described in this picture. Uh, but you again have this info pool and the bucket index pool. And this in entirety, the, all of these together will construct what we call is an RGW zone. In itself, it doesn't mean much, but if we move on um, to constructs like uh, RGW Federation and your application, these zones are what play a major role in, in providing the functionality. So essentially, in the picture here, what you see is that there are multiple uh, zones, zone A1 and zone B1. Each of them have their bucket info and index pool and data pool. And then this, this, this arrow here. So essentially what this arrow says is that the info, the bucket info of the of the, the information that is stored in RGW is present in both the zones. So essentially there could be a request that comes in to this RGW in zone A1. Um, and it is quite possible that the data that it needs to serve is not present in A1. So this bucket info will now redirect the request that has come in um, by just looking at the information and checking whether that information is present within zone A or not. If it's not present, what it does, it redirects this request to zone B1. So it's essentially uh, the, the bucket info pool that has information that it is using to figure out whether the request can be fulfilled by the local zone or it needs to contact a different zone. So I guess the, the idea is that it has a global view of users and buckets. Um, so it would your request may land in any of these zones, but it will be served by the correct zone without you having to do anything. It's the RGWs that are redirecting the requests. Uh, now, uh, expanding on this, we also have this construct of zone group. So what is different about zone groups? And you can imagine these zones and zone groups uh, being in different parts of the world, different con continents, or just different geograph geographically separated locations. Um, and th these zone groups, what they essentially have 
uh, different is that you here you as you can see these uh, arrows here these indicate that the data that is present in these um, index pools and the data pools is also replicated. Now, there is um, one-way replication and there is two-way replication. So essentially, it is possible that when uh, <clears throat> your client writes to uh, zone C2 and there is a client other client reading from zone C1, uh, there is asynchronous repl replication that keeps going on, even if the, there is a, an update that was made to the same bucket that is present in C2 and has not yet been updated in C1. Uh, so we make sure that the, uh, the a bucket gets updated before we serve the request. So there is a concept of asynchronous replication, but here the only thing different is that the data is also replicated between zone groups. Okay, so among other things, um, so as I mentioned, um, th this is essentially S3 API compatible, and we try very hard uh, to make sure that it works fine in terms of RGW features, and we don't break compatibility. So we have a full-fledged um, su uh, suite of tests that are compatible uh, that we call Ceph S3 tests. And it's a functional test suite. And uh, as far as I know, it's not just used by um, Ceph. It's used by other um, software uh, projects that are also building similar products. And this is, this is something that we uh, maintain and run regularly to make sure that all the RGW features that land are compatible with the, with the S3 API. RGW also supports um, STS, Security Token Service. It's basically a framework for uh, interoperating with other authentication and authorization systems like Kerberos, etc. There's also um, encryption and compression. So when it comes to compression, so you could do things like compress um, the data at the RGW layer before even writing it to Rados. So RGW essentially supports that. And there are other things like course and static uh, website hosting. Um, there's another, uh, what is interesting is the metadata search with Elasticsearch. So we also support um, doing, so the metadata that we store in these metadata uh, pools, uh, we, uh, we support search in terms of Elasticsearch. And we also have um, a PubSub implementation so this is fairly recent, but uh, has been merged a couple of releases ago, I believe. Um, so we heard the idea is that it's event driven. So a pop sum just means that if there is a bucket um, that you write to, uh, it will trigger a lambda somewhere else, somewhere else uh, in terms of like um, uh, it's an event that will be driven based on the action that has been done on a particular uh, bucket in in this F cluster. Uh, now this is this helps with integration with things like K native serverless and Kafka. Um, and then there are yeah other things like um, so as you can see there are a lot of features that we provide. We have multiple storage classes so you can uh, decide what kind of radius pools um, you want your RGW data to live in based on performance requirements, SLAs, et cetera. Um, and uh, the idea is that you can also apply different uh, policies on, on these, uh, on, on these um, data objects that are getting stored in radars. So essentially, you could have a separate pool where you have a different policy that is um, applied by RGW. Uh, which is actually getting stored in a different uh, radius pool. Now, there are also life cycle uh, management things. So essentially, um, you could set policies where uh, you want something like automatically move my objects between storage tiers after a particular amount of time. Um, and that is all time-based. So you can move between tiers or even expire things from a particular tier based on, uh, on time. And finally, you can do something like um, archive zones. Archive zones are essentially creating a full history where you're preserving uh, all the storage history in, 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 in the Ceph storage cluster, no matter what kind of policies are there. So these are kind of um, mostly used by you know, archival use cases, I would say. Um, but uh, RGW lets you do that. <clears throat> 
Okay, I think that's uh, where we are going to be wrapping up RGW. Are there any questions on RGW or can we move on? No questions here. Okay, so let's move on to uh, RPD, which stands for Rados Block Storage. So, RBD is essentially a virtual uh, block device, uh, which lets you store disk images in Rados. Um, so you can stripe data across RBD data across many objects in an RBD pool. Um, the idea is to be able to uh, decouple your host, your hypervisor, uh, almost analogous to what um, AWS is, EBS is. Uh, but here you have two clients of uh, imp client implementations. So one which is um, virtualization based and one which is essentially a Linux host. So in terms of uh, supporting uh, both kinds of um, architectures, so we have uh, libRBD that we use for a virtualization stack and we have krbd, which is kernel RBD. Uh, that we use uh, for the Linux uh, host side of things. But finally, what is serving the RBD pool beneath is uh, the Rados cluster. So uh, RBD has integration with LibWord. OpenStack is one of the biggest users of RBD, I have to say. And things like Kubernetes, Proxmox, CloudStack, uh, other, other things which are probably not listed here as well. So uh, these are a uh, couple of main uh, use cases of RBD. And uh, now let's move on to what kind of things you can do with RBD. So one of the things, basic things you can think of with uh, RBD is snapshots. So snapshots are just read-only associated with uh, individual RBD images, and they are point in time consistent. So if you take a snapshot, you, you're sure to have a point in time consistent uh, image or a snapshot of that particular image. Now, there's also things like uh, clones, which are the next level. So essentially, the difference here is that snapshots are read-only, uh, while clones are uh, writable overlay over an existing snapshot. So one of the use cases that I can think of is like you could have a base OS, which is like a snapshot uh, of like a fresh install that you've done. And then you could have clones like here in this picture, VMA, VMB, VMC, that are clones based out of this base OS, um, which you can further snapshot if you if you need to, but then you can st start using them or like efficiently in um, O1 time creation, you can start you consuming these clones, which are created out of these uh, snapshots. Now, with uh, clones, you can do things like resizing them, renaming them, et cetera. Uh, but the general uh, difference is what I just described earlier. Now, moving on to the data layout. Um, so essentially, every uh, RBD image um, maps to objects. And these objects have uh, the header part of it and the data part of it. Now, the header part of it has uh, things like name, size, striping parameter, basic uh, metadata in the sense whether it has snapshot or not, that kind of information, um, and other options and uh, locking owner ownership information. Uh, and the data you can imagine is essentially chunks of block device content. So it's like um, the big uh, the RBD image is getting uh, striped onto 4MB uh, radius objects. Uh, which is, again, the configurable I mentioned. Um, but the interesting thing here is objects um, are only created if and when data is written. So if you just create an RBD image uh, of a particular size, only the header objects get created. These data objects don't get created until and unless you actually start uh, writing to, to the image, So which is good. Um, and uh, again, like like all other applications we've talked about, it they support um, replicated and erasure coded based on whatever uh, your choice is. Now, RBD also has a journaling mode. Um, so the concept of a journaling mode is that all the writes that are coming through are first uh, written to a journal. 
And these are most recent uh, writes, including any metadata changes. And uh, they also the journal also gets trimmed uh, based on age. But the general idea is it anything that comes in first gets written to the journal and then gets flushed to the data objects. Now, in general, um, this does on 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 its own doesn't make too much sense, but it starts making sense when we talk about RBD mirroring. So the concept of RBD mirroring um, is extrapolating this earlier picture that we had where you had libRBD uh, talking to a journal pool and a data pool. Um, here we have something called an RBD mirror daemon. So it's a separate daemon that is sitting here um, and trying to talk to these two clusters. So the idea is that this um, journal pool is essentially talking to this RBD mirror which um, asynchronously replicates um, the, the entire information that is there in cluster A to cluster B, um, and again, creates a point in time crash consistent copy of the image in a remote cluster. So all this happens just by mirroring the journal. So it's reading the journal that is present in cluster A and writing out to cluster B asynchronously. Um, so this is how you, you are asynchronously replicating across clusters, which could be, again, um, in different parts of the world. Um, but the idea is to be able to uh, mirror live data and snapshots um, and maintain a copy. Um, based on, on whatever uh, requirements the application has. Now, each of these uh, um, RBD mirror daemons, based on how many images are there in the Ceph cluster, uh, you can scale them out. You can have multiple RBD mirror daemons, uh, but uh, it, it depends on kind of the scale that we are running uh, running at. OK, so talking about other RBD features, um, uh, RBD top, it's a nice um, feature. Like it's essentially a command that lets you know what the real time view of the IO activity in uh, different RBD images is, which comes in handy a lot of times. Um, you can also um, enforce things like quotas on, on different images. So these can be done at uh, provisioning time uh, to make sure that any client is not exceeding its quota. Um, and also, uh, in terms of isolation, there is something called uh, namespace isolation. So if you want to restrict the, the permissions that uh, clients have on, or like you only want some clients to operate on certain RBD images and not all RBD images, though you have other RBD images in the same Rados cluster, you can do that just by means of uh, namespace isolation. And you can also do things like import, export, um, also do incremental diff, uh, diff between the snapshots you've taken uh, over uh, different periods of time. Um, and you also have this uh, RBD trash concept, which lets you keep deleted images over a period of time um, before purging. So it's essentially holding onto it for, again, maybe for archival purposes or anything else that you have a use case for. Um, there are different ways um, in which you can consume RBD. Um, the Linux kernel client, there's an R NBD client, um, depending on whichever use case works for you. There's also an uh, iSCSI gateway and uh, also a libRBD implementation that can be dynamically linked uh, based on your application needs. Um, so these are kind of the implementations uh, users can choose from. All right, so we are now going to CFFS, which is the final platform slash application that uh, Ceph supports. And this is essentially the file storage. So sometimes uh, Ceph sometimes gets uh, confused as a file storage system, but it's not just file. We describe the other things. This is the file aspect of, of Ceph, uh, I would say. So essentially, CFFS is a distributed network file system. Um, so there are files, directories, rename, hard links that you can uh, create in a Ceph, uh, CephFS cluster. And uh, you have the ability to um, do concurrent shared access from many clients. So multiple clients can uh, write to the same files in the Rados cluster. Um, CephFS does provide uh, strong consistency and coherent caching uh, by means of uh, locking and other kinds of mechanisms um, in the code base. 
But uh, the idea is that what you see from one node in a particular file or a directory in ZFS, uh, that's the same thing that you see from a different uh, client's perspective. So it's, that's how it's strongly consistent. Um, there is uh, another daemon uh, that will uh, that I'm going to introduce, which is uh, the MDS, which is the metadata server, which ZFS uh, is the only uh, user of. Um, but the, the, what it allows you to essentially do is scale metadata and data independently. So in this picture, you can see that um, the data here is getting directly written to the Redis cluster. Uh, but there is this metadata where this new um, daemon type shows up, this new picture here is essentially the metadata daemon that uh, that the, the, this FFS um, client needs to talk to. Uh, before operating on the data part of it. Now, all operations don't need you to talk to the metadata server. So essentially, the uh, CFFS uh, host can directly talk to uh, radar objects just while doing reads and writes. But when it comes to uh, creating directories or listing directories, etc., cetera, uh, the metadata server is what it needs to talk to. Um, so yeah, this is this is what I was exactly talking about, the metadata server. Um, it's actually a managed file system namespace. Um, it helps coordinate file access between clients. Um, it does so by um, the strong consistency that it provides is by means of locks and leases and uh, uh, other kinds of uh, complex mechanisms that are there in CFFS. Uh, but uh, the idea is that, again, this uh, is like, the manager daemon that I talked about earlier, uh, like these core components, uh, the MDS, you usually ha you'd have uh, one active and multiple uh, one to ten of active plus some standbys. Uh, so essentially, when the the main uh, MDS fails for whatever reason, the standbys uh, can take its place. Uh, but depends on like how large your cluster is. You can choose. You could even have one main and one standby. Or you could have multiple standbys uh, depending on your use case. All right. So now this is a more detailed picture of how um, metadata is stored in Rados. Um, so as you can see, uh, this is a little different from RBD. I would say. So clearly, you can see two pools here. There's a metadata pool and there's a data pool. So all the data that CFFS uh, writes uh, is stored in the data pool. And for all metadata purposes, there's a different pool. Now you can do smart things like if you want to make your metadata access faster, you can store the metadata pool on a faster device like an SSD. And you can store your data pool in a hard disk. Um, but Ceph doesn't force you to do that. That's just optimization that you can do. But in uh, in general, the idea is that um, all the metadata goes into this um, metadata server, and uh, it gets stored in terms of uh, directories and metadata journal in this metadata pool. And the data part of it again is something that you that the client directly write, uh, talks to to the OSTs. Um, and uh, reads and writes from it. So even in CFFS, you can do snapshots. Um, the thing that is different um, in CFFS compared to any uh, other uh, similar uh, pro product is that snapshots can be done on any directory. Um, and it, it applies to nested files and directories, and this uh, the, the granularity is at volume and subvolume of subvolume levels. So essentially, you can snapshot any directory that is hosted in your CFS cluster. Um, these snapshots are again point in time consistent uh, from the perspective of POSIX uh, API um, at client level. Now, um, as you can see on the right, there is, is there are simple things that you can do to even create snapshots. Uh, it, it is as simple as that you do a make dir, uh in, in your local dot snap uh, directory, and it creates a snapshot. And when you want to delete it, it is as simple as doing an rmdir of that snapshot. So uh, snapshot management, per se, 
is uh, is pretty easy and efficient in, in CFFS. And similar, the concept is again similar here that uh, snapshots only consume space when any kind of changes are made to it. So if you just create a snapshot, it is not going to uh, consume any space in, in the cluster. All right, so moving on to other CFFS features. So you can have multiple um, CFFS uh, file systems per cluster. You could, each of those uh, uh, CFFS clusters could have uh, different um, MDSs to cater to the, the underlying storage, uh, but it lets you create multiple file systems within sharing the same Rados cluster. Um, you have X things like X adders and file locking uh, that CFFS provides. You can again uh, have quotas similar to what I described for RBD. And you can do things like access restrictions on a subdirectory level. Um, you can also create tiered storage similar uh, just, just by using the, the Rados pool uh, capability of um, segregating your storage based on the application needs. You can create different storage tiers and adjust your striping uh, strategy based on, on the cluster setup. Um, and there's also things like lazy IO uh, that you can do. Um, so these are, I think, for mostly advanced users, where you optionally relax the CFFS consistency uh, requirements on a per file basis for um, mostly for HPC applications. And in terms of how you can use CFFS, there's a Linux Gurney client for it. We also have a Ceph um, Fuse implementation, NFS and uh, CIFS implementation, and a basic uh, libcffs for those who want to run their own application using CFFS. So these are kind of ways in which, multiple ways in which you can consume CFFS. And I think that kind of completes the whole uh, storage platform story. So we have now touched upon all the building blocks here. Um, are there any questions at this point or should I keep going? I guess you can keep going. Sounds good. OK, so now we've talked about the uh, applications and radars and things like that. Now the question comes, like, how do you manage a Ceph cluster? Uh, first thing that I want to talk about here is an integrated dashboard. So the dashboard works uh, as a manager module. So you can just enable it after setting up or installing a Ceph cluster. Um, and you can give it a port on which you want to host this um, dashboard. And essentially, it helps you um, do multiple things. One is monitor you, the health of your Ceph cluster, uh, the overall um, IO capacity, utilization, uh, the status of your uh, separate, uh, all kinds of demons that are there in your cluster, the status of your hosts, everything. Um, it, it gives you a snapshot of, of what how the cluster is doing in general in terms of monitoring. Um, then comes metrics. So there is um, multiple uh, metrics that the manager captures, like I described earlier. Uh, now, these metrics are used and displayed in multiple ways. So we have a Prometheus manager module uh, that captures all these interesting metrics and aggregates them in, in a different level. And we have Grafana dashboards uh, in, in this Ceph dashboard that consumes all those metrics and creates uh, these uh, user consumable uh, graphs that make more sense to users. So uh, dashboard is one way of like looking at the stats of your cluster or how your cluster is doing over time, um, just in terms of um, Grafana dashboards. Um, the final thing is uh, in terms of management. So you can do things like change your configuration. You can uh, provision new OSDs. Uh, you can do all kinds of day two tasks that you can think of just by means of the dashboard and you don't need to use the CLI if you don't really want to. We, having said that, we have a CLI which a lot of people use and uh, like to use, um, which is always an option, but the dashboard is kind of easy and more intuitive and helps you do a lot of things very easily. Um, among other management features, uh, so Ceph has a whole bunch of uh, health monitoring, uh, 
which is visible on the dashboard and also using CLI tools. Um, the idea is to be able to um, raise uh, warnings and alerts and errors in terms of states. So each uh, warning that we raise or each error condition that we raise has a particular um, meaning. And so each uh, alert has an ID uh, and each ID has is documented and uh, you, if, if you run into a particular situation where your Ceph cluster is coming up with a particular alert, there are ways of going up and looking at what exactly this means, what do you need to do about it, what is a workaround, or you know, what, what is the immediate action required from the user. So that's where the monitoring, uh, health monitoring piece is very useful for those who are actually running a Ceph cluster. Um, then there is configuration uh, management. So there, there is like um, a mo like in the monitors, we store all kinds of configurations uh, and configurations that are configuration changes that are being made uh, by the CLI or by the dashboard or or uh, you know runtime changes that get made. All uh, there is a history of all configuration changes that are made uh, to a Ceph cluster. In, in the in the database that we we have so you can do things like if you want to just roll back and say I just want to use the defaults I, I don't want to apply any of the changes that I made through all these tools you can go ahead and do that so it's not uh, super complicated it's pretty simple um, then uh, let's talk about device management so these OSTs and other things that I just talked about so these finally map to raw devices. Um, and you can just map them to raw devices or you can use something like LVM. Uh, but we um, kind of have the information of vendor, model, serial. So we kind of derive all that information um, and uh, use them in, in some ways, like in smart. So we have uh, health metrics that we gather from these devices. And uh, if you, if you want to, in, if you opt in, you can do things like uh, device uh, life expectancy. So essentially, if you enable this particular module, you will be able to see if there is a particular device or a particular OST uh, that is about to die so that you can take some preventive measures before that actual failure happens. So that kind of helps you um, avoid last minute trouble. So, um, Optionally, uh, there is a way like you can preemptively evacuate a failing device, like a planned planned removal of devices that are failing. So it kind of gives you hints as to when you need to uh, take any sort of action um, on, on, based on the on the health status of your devices. Um, then uh, I want to talk about something uh, which is also unique. I would say is telemetry. So we have. Uh, a system by means of which there is phone home anonymized metrics that are sent to Ceph developers like us. So Ceph users can, uh, and it is obviously opt-in. So if you opt-in, uh, you will be able to send useful metrics to Ceph developers uh, in terms of which versions uh, users are running in terms of what the utilization is, what kind of features um, they, they are using or they are not. That gives us an idea of, of uh, what our user base likes or dislikes. Um, and also there's recently we've also added um, crash reports. So if there are crashes that are happening in the wild, um, we capture the version associated with that crash and also parts of the um, stack trace. We anonymize a lot of information that is um, that we do not want to capture from um, uh, from users or from clusters for privacy reasons, uh, and we we give users complete choice as to whether they want to opt in or not. And we we take extra caution to anonymize data that should be anonymized. So uh, even before users opt in, they have the ability to just take, show, see a preview of what they will actually be sending. And if only they are okay with it, they can go and say yes to sending that information. But the, the useful thing is when they do opt in, uh, developers like us get to see uh, all kinds of um, crashes or things that we need to prioritize. Or a lot of times, um, based on what the user pattern is like, or usage pattern is, or any kind of optimizations that we need to be doing, any kind of configurations that uh, changes that we need to do, uh, we, we get 
we get a lot of useful ideas from those kind of information. Um, the next thing that we are targeting, this has not happened yet, is um, capturing performance-related metrics uh, from uh, user clusters uh, to kind of uh, give us an idea of how we can better automatically tune the system um, or like change some of our default con configuration values, et cetera, to work um, better by default. Uh, instead instead of users having to go change uh, things themselves. Um, so I think that's something we are looking forward to, but that will also be uh, opt-in. So if users only want to send that information, um, they will be able to send it. But in general, I want to emphasize the importance of, of such a system because this is how uh, we symbiotically improve the project in general. Um, so... Uh, Let's now talk about some installation options. Um, so there are multiple ways in which um, upstream Ceph can be installed. Uh, currently, uh, the most popular and the most easy is Ceph ADM. Uh, this was introduced a couple of um, releases ago, and uh, a lot of users uh, have already switched to using it. The idea is it's, it's an orchestration interface for installation and management, and it's based on containers. Uh, and as I said, it's as simple as running one command and you should be able to bootstrap a Ceph ADM cluster in, in seconds. We also have a Rook um, integration. Uh, so for Ceph clusters uh, that want to run in Kubernetes world, uh, there is a, a way to <coughs> deploy Ceph using Rook. And then there are other methods. Ceph Ansible, DeepSea, Puppet. Ceph Ansible used to be something we widely used uh, a few years ago. Uh, but I think some uh, users still continue to use it. Uh, but there are other multiple there are multiple ways to install Ceph. So that uh, there's there are links to. I'm going to be sharing this um, these slides for later consumption. So you can feel free to look at some of the documentation links that I've added here. All right. Any more questions on uh, the management side of things, or should I move to the last bit? I guess I just had a question about um, the metrics. Mm -hmm. Show you which um, you know if people use the block storage or the object storage or the file system more. Is it yeah. kind of yeah. evenly distributed? I would say it's not evenly distributed. So I would say uh, block storage and RGW have been more widely used. Um, than CFFS. CFFS uh, has also been used, but it's uh, probably uh, fresher uh, in terms of like uh, we like things like uh, erasure coding support was not there in CFFS until like a few years ago. So, so there have been some reasons because of which CFFS has, uh, has been less used than the others. Uh, but in general, we, we can get an idea of what the distribution is. And uh, I haven't really gotten and looked into what that looks like. But in general, uh, from, from my um, interpretation, it is RGW and RG, uh, RBD and then CFFS. OK, nice. Any more questions? Yeah, I had a question about snapshots. I just posted it in the chat window. Mm -hmm. um... So you, your question is regarding snapshots. If I have a snapshot at home uh, and I am CD'd into home documents, can I access the top level snapshot within documents or do I have to? Um, I think you'll have to uh, CD into the dot snap uh, daily, daily dot three directory. That's my again. I'm not. I'm not an RBD expert. Uh, that's my hunch, but uh, I think that's what is. But yeah, an RBD expert can tell you that. I'm a Rados expert, so any Rados questions are my my territory. I think it will be a, a useful feature, so it'd be a, uh, probably a good idea to bring up. Yeah. Back, back. Yeah, I can, I can, I, I can, I can. You know, that's that's that. You bring a good point. I mean, any any such questions, uh, I can find the right people to answer those questions. And if they they are they don't exist and do make sense, they can always be converted into feature requests. Yeah, just for reference, um, back in uh, I think it was like 1997 or 1998, uh, uh, um, one of the jobs I was at, um, I was doing a uh, we put in a uh, NetApp server uh, for. Uh, mm -hmm. 
and and this is exactly how it behaved. It was very convenient. Mm -hmm. And that's that's uh, it's quite possible it does behave. I haven't gotten to using RBD recently, um, but yeah, I can check and get back to you. Okay, thanks. Mm -hmm. All right, I don't see any more questions, so maybe we can move on to the next bit. Okay, now I'm going to be uh, talking about some of the Ceph community and the ecosystem around it. Um, so given that we are an open source software, we have um, an LGPL 2.1 and LGPL 3 um, license for most of the code, I would say. There could be bits here and there which are not and have separate licenses, but that's the majority. Um, all our collaboration happens on GitHub. Uh, which is all open to all. Anybody can uh, contribute and look at the code. Um, and all our uh, bug tracking happens in Tracker, which is a Redmine-based tracker, uh, Redmine-based. So it's tracker.ceph.com. Uh, in terms of communication, um, we use a lot of uh, um, email lists. So we have a dev list. We also have user lists and um, all kinds of lists. So a lot of communication. Uh, Ceph is a very widely distributed community. It's not just in the US, it's spread all across the world. We have users in Australia. We are actually, it's interesting that only last week, I found out that we are going to get access to an, uh, a, a, a scale cluster. And it is actually a, a lab that we are going to get hold of in Australia. Uh, and we'll be doing some of our upstream testing and testing some of the latest versions that we will be releasing um, next year. Uh, so before we do the release, it will be mostly like a, a, tr a scale trial test that we run on that particular cluster. And it's going to be like 4,000 OSDs or something. And they are just offering to help us test our software on that cluster. So that's pretty cool. So that's where all the all these email lists and um, so we also have IRC. Uh, we, we, we continue to have uh, like direct communication on uh, IRC. There's a channel called SafeDevel where most of our direct communication happens. And uh, for offline communication, email lists are the best. Um, so uh, beyond that, we have a lot of video chat. Again, distributed community. Video chat is the first thing that you know, even before uh, the before coronavirus or anything else, we were uh, doing a lot of video chats. And uh, uh, we, we have all our meetings um, that we do. Uh, some of our meetings get recorded, some of our design discussions and uh, quarterly presentations or monthly um, developer talks are all posted on YouTube. So one of the most useful resources is to go look at YouTube's, uh, Ceph's YouTube channel. There's a lot of uh, presentations, tech talks, uh, code walkthroughs that people can actually learn from um, and start contributing to Ceph, or even like Ceph users can learn more about the architecture of Ceph. Uh, and you know, um, take it from there. But I guess the, the general idea is that we do a lot of video meetings. And all, all of our stand-ups, et cetera, that we do every week um, or every day are all on video chat. Uh, we publish releases. So we have a release cycle of, uh, of a year. So we every year, we are doing a release. Our releases are alphabetical. Uh, currently, we are working on our Q release. Um, so in 2021, we did a Pacific release, which was the P release. Now we are working on Q, which is Quincy. And at a, at a time, we um, we support essentially two releases. Um, so two years, uh, so anything that came up two years ago is what we support. And anything new comes up, then we, we have like two existing releases at any time that we support. And for all the stable releases, all these two stable releases that we are running all the time, we do periodic uh, uh, point releases. So essentially, any bug fixes or any essential features that need to be backported get released periodically, and uh, users can consume them. Um, in terms of distributions, we work with Debian, SUSE, Ubuntu, Red Hat, and on the right, what we have, what I, what the, the some of the um, logos here are of contributors. Who are contributors who have con like highest number of contributions to, to Ceph that have been made in the past few years? Um, so as you can see, CERN CERN is one of the biggest um, users of Ceph, CephFS um, and Ceph in general. 
and um, they they were the ones who helped us do one of our largest scale testing um, back in like like two, two years or three years ago. That was 10,000 USDs with a CERN cluster. And they are an active contributor too. So we have a lot of contributions coming in from CERN. Um, so in terms of integrations, we integrate with OpenStack, Kubernetes, Rook, like I already mentioned, Linux, KVM. So these are all our partners. Uh, RBD heavily, um, uh, the OpenStack community, I think uh, at least half or I don't, close to half maybe open stock deployments use Ceph. Kubernetes, a whole new world of Ceph and Kubernetes integration is coming up. Um, there are already a lot of active clusters. Uh, Red Hat also has products based on that. Um, so yeah, we have a lot of um, cloud-based ecosystems that consume our storage. Um, in terms of events, um, so we have uh, two main um, events. One is what we call Ceph Days. So these are one day regional events spread all across the world. And I mean, 10 is just a number, but based on like um, availability of people and the interest in the community, we host uh, multiple of these per year. Uh, I believe there's one that's currently being planned in Berlin now that things have started to settle down. Uh, but the idea is to just get the local regional community together and we do self talks, we, we have user talks, dev talks, and even uh, self developers who belong to that particular region try to attend those events to have face to face interaction with um, the community. So it's usually like 50 to 200 people based on where the event is. Um, normally, you have a single track of technical talks and also mostly user focused talks because that's where um, we also learn a lot of um, we get to learn a lot of new things from users about uh, what their problems are or where the bottlenecks are or even like some useful um, feature requests etc that come in as a part of these events um, so that's about Ceph days and the larger scale um, events that we have is a yearly um, global event which is called Cephalocon. Um, this is attended by much more people from all across the globe, and we do it once in a year in the spring. And I'm pretty excited to say that we finally have started planning our next Cephalocon, which is going to be in the month of April in 2022 in Portland, Oregon. So that is going to be exciting. We've had multiple. We've had um, once in Barcelona. Uh, we've had in um, Beijing and China. So th those have been fun. Um, so we're looking forward to the one in North America now. So these usually, these are like, as as written down here, it's two-day events. So we have multiple tracks. We have user, user talks, developer talks, even vendor talks. Um, but these, we try to align them with releases. So every time we have a big release that we do, we try to emphasize on what's coming up in that release um, what to expect from that release and things like that in those cephalicons. So uh, yeah, any any of you who are interested in any of these events and you s happen to know one happening around you, I'd, I'd say it's worth giving it a try and attending one of these. Uh, now I'm going to touch upon what the Ceph Foundation is. Uh, so Ceph Foundation is essentially an organization um, of industry members supporting the Ceph project and community. It's not just one company. Uh, it's multiple members, they, which, which are which include vendors, cloud companies, major users, academic and government institutions um, from all over the globe. Uh, currently, we have 34 members, and the number is growing. It's part of the Linux Foundation, so it's managed by them. Uh, but all the event planning and um, other things uh, are done by the Ceph Foundation. So Ceph Foundation has people from the Ceph community participating in. Um, uh, Ceph Foundation essentially takes care of the well-being of the project as such. So we have all our upstream CI infrastructure, our community hardware, all the documentation efforts that are uh, made in, as a part of improving the documentation are funded by the Ceph Foundation. And here we have some of the existing uh, members of the Ceph, current members, I would say, of the Ceph Foundation. So you've got some premier members here. 
Then we also have some general members and some associate members. So yes, Boston Uni University is actually part of it. And even uh, University of California, Santa Cruz, Monash University, which is from Australia, University of Michigan, these are all part of um, the CEF Foundation. So that's all about the CEF Foundation. And I think this brings me to my last um, slide. Uh, so this is all the information that you need to know to reach out to CEF developers or to know more about CEF. Um, and as I said, the CEF YouTube channel is, uh, is a great resource for anybody who wants to learn about CEF or wants to contribute to CEF. So uh, with that, I think I would like to conclude and uh, open it up for more discussion. All right. Thank you very much. We appreciate it. No problem. Yeah, thanks. That was a great talk. Problem. Oh, okay. I, I hope. I mean, I, I really hope after after this talk, uh, people know a little more about Seth, if not everything. Yeah. Uh, could you send us a copy of your slides uh, so we can post on Absolutely. our website? Absolutely. 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 Great. Yeah, I'll put my email address in the uh, in the chat window. I think I have your email. We did talk over email about setting this thing up, right? Yeah. Well, that's right. Yeah. Perfect. All right. So I can actually share my information as well. Um, I don't think I did that. So my email is here in case anybody has any follow-up questions or anything they want to know more. That's my Red App email and that's my full name. So feel free to find me anywhere. Yeah, thank you very, very much. Really enjoyed the presentation. Thanks. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity and looking forward to talking to you guys more. This seems, seems like an interesting bunch here. Okay. I particularly like the uh, snapshot feature. I've, yeah. been I've been looking for that in file systems for, uh, I don't know, for almost 20 years. And uh, mm -hmm. when, I was, when I started in the NetApp like more than 20 years ago, it was, uh, it was basically the, uh, the way I expected the snap snapshot. And every other system I looked at uh, when I looked at the snapshot, I was really disappointed that they didn't work that way. <laughs> yes, I'm going to make it a point to confirm the answer to you, to okay. your question. I wonder if yeah. you're aware of anyone building home Ceph clusters out of Raspberry Pis. Trust me, I've heard about it. I cannot uh, name the person or the, but I've 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 heard about these kind of projects that people are taking up. There, I'm pretty sure there's like on Reddit or somewhere you'll find some discussions around around this kind of stuff. Yeah, it's been, it's been a to do project of mine for quite some time, and I wanted to to learn about Ceph and use it for. The, uh, the storage backend for Kubernetes cluster, for my media player, for photography, uh, archive, a whole bunch of stuff. Hmm. I wasn't sure yeah. if it had the power to, uh, to cover all of that, though. Yeah, I'm pretty sure. I think I, uh, I may be able to share. So I have, we have a doc, uh, a doc uh, writer uh, whom the Ceph Foundation actually is um, Funded, and he's he has this curious idea, uh, and he is also interested, like any other naive uh, Ceph user, as to uh, let us say I have these you know bunch of hardware lying down in my house. Uh, how can I build a class a Ceph cluster out of that? And he's actually writing a post about it, and I'm pretty sure he's also going to be covering stuff about uh, things like Raspberry Pi and like how can you create a Ceph cluster out of a Raspberry Pi? So. Uh, I think you should keep an eye out on some of the Ceph posts and Ceph documentation that gets updated. Uh, the last time I spoke to him, he was kind of finalizing that draft. So there's going to be more information on what you are looking for very soon. That sounds great. Look forward to hearing about that. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to go stop the live feed, Jabber. <laughs>
Okay.